I'm sorry. If you're waiting here, you don't want to spray. This operation is in case uh, yeah. anything happens to that, we provide a transcript or whatever. Uh, they're going to give us a transcript. Yeah. Got a little something to do. Um, we found a little, little autobiographical book work. And I just wanted me to get this to the Oh, for heaven's sake. There's a little, little chapter in there about that famous one. <laughs> well, listen, you and all, please give her my heartfelt thanks. So I'll see you in a little bit. Where am I? Right there. All right. Oh, right. right. Only uh, some of the other and the other microphones there with the U.S. News and World Report. Right. I've just been telling the people, Dave Gergen now. If there are any really difficult questions, I'll let him answer them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in my 20 minutes, I thought I'd try to go back to certain fundamentals. We were taught in journalism school that one of the toughest questions to ask is why. So I'm going to ask you a few why questions. And if I may start on the um, old issue of taxation. In the light of a $2.3 trillion debt and these recurring horrendous debts, why do you insist on no tax increase? Well, because the record shows, Jack, that all the tax increase has ever done with regard to the Congress is enable them to keep on spending and spend additionally. It's never used in any effort to reduce the debt. We have been running a debt with only a couple of annual exceptions, running a deficit for almost 60 years. And for all but about four of those years, the Democrats have controlled both houses of the legislature, well, with the exception of the six here that, where I had one house and they had another. And even if you go back to Kennedy, his tax program, or tax cut program, was very similar to the one that we instituted when we first came in here as part of our economic recovery plan. Well, why did your tax cut program result <coughs> in all of these deficits? It didn't. It is the spending. I can give you a figure on that before I got here, what was going on and what was built. It's structural. You remember long about the middle 60s, a man named Lyndon Johnson was organizing his war on poverty. Well, from 1965 to 1980, in those 15 years, the budget went up to just about five times what it had been in 1960. The deficit went up to 38 times what it had been in 1960. It is structural, it is built in. I knew when I came here there was no way that you could balance the budget in one year, but we had set out with the idea of doing it. If, if they had given me the budget I asked for in, for 1982, the cumulative deficits between 82 and 86 would have been $207 billion less than they turned out to be. The, Kennedy, when he was fighting for his tax cut, he was very eloquent to the end that taxes, that this cut in taxes was actually uh, going to result in more revenue, and it did. This was, this was also true in the, in the tax cuts back in the uh, uh, Roaring Twenties. They resulted in higher revenues, and our tax cuts have resulted in more revenues at the lower rates than when the rates were high. I believe that the biggest factor in the, in now that we're in our 58th month of economic recovery, that the biggest factor in all of that was our reduction of, of rates. It offers an incentive. Uh, I, I was a classic example, Jack, back in the picture business when they were giving us all that if money. Uh, and I was freelancing and I was also, a couple of pictures put me in, a, in the 90% bracket. Well, you know, they could offer me going with the wind and there wasn't any way that I was going to work for 10 cents on the dollar. 90%. But why, in light of what you say about the, the structural built-in effects, why then are you supporting a new entitlement program for catastrophic health insurance? Well, for one thing, it is not the program that the Congress now is talking about, and they're talking about a program I could not accept. Uh, this one is one that imposes uh, an unnecessary tax on, on people who can ill afford to pay it, our elderly citizens. 
we think that the program that we proposed, first of all, the catastrophic illness thing uh, is one, and with what has happened today and prices and all, that can literally wipe out a family. We had a plan in California that involved the private insurance sector, and they were willing, and we couldn't get it passed. But when I was governor, we had a plan that would have insured uh, everybody against catastrophic illness. And the total cost was only about $35 an was, individual. Of course, some time ago. Yes. But um, the, the thing is, where we didn't get any attention for it, or paid to it, I know, was the fact that there were only about 10,000 such cases a year in California out of 20 odd million people. Well, wouldn't these plans, whether it's Dr. Bowen's plan or the, um, the Senate proposal, wouldn't they positively invite enlargement, expansion as the years go by to well, get to a national health insurance? Well, that was what we thought we were insuring against. Uh, that I know that, that the other possibility is there even now because there are some people in the Congress who've never given up the goal of socialized medicine. We, we could identify a few of those. Uh, <laughs> yes, we could. Switch to something else. Why have you picked so controversial a nominee for the Supreme Court as Bob Bork? Well, I don't think uh, he should be controversial. Uh, his record, uh, first of all, the people who supported him for uh, the next highest court in the land, the Circuit Court of Appeals here in Washington. Um, I would refer you to Biden's statement when he endorsed him for that position and went out of his way to castigate anyone who would suggest that they should vote against him because of his political philosophy. Uh, I don't know whether Mr. Biden remembers saying that or not, but I do. Do you have any idea why these members of the American Bar Association panel uh, voted in effect against him? Well, it doesn't surprise me, the difference of opinion in the, in the Bar Association there, but what does surprise me, Jack, is the way uh, so much of the media is reporting those four individuals mm -hmm. as somehow kind of way out. After all, there were 11 <laughs> on the yeah. other side. One that took the middle position of no objection, uh, which is their custom, but then 10 who gave them the highest recommendation that the Bar Association can give. What, 11 to 4? I think that's a pretty good score. But you have not heard the reasons why these four changed from the position that the Bar took um, five years ago? No, I, I can't say that I, I have. I assume that it's the same thing that making uh, other individuals sound off. But look, he has never, in over a hundred cases that he has forwarded, he's, that he's made decisions on that were then forwarded to the Supreme Court, he has never been reversed by the Supreme Court. I wasn't sure that there were a hundred that went up. I thought there were fewer than that, but he has never been reversed in no. No, I was told that it, that it reached a, a hundred or maybe a hundred plus. Well, what do you anticipate will happen to the confirmation? Well, I'm optimistic that we're going to get it. I just can't believe that when, you know, I met in California with 17 individuals who were the heads of every law enforcement national group in the United States and unanimous. They are supporting and they have come together like the head of the police association and all of these things, district attorneys and so forth, they have all joined together in a single force to support the Bork nomination. Let me leap to another subject here, foreign affairs now. Why do you persist in supporting the Contra cause in Nicaragua, which is an effort to overthrow a duly <coughs> established government? Well, first, Jack, I have to challenge that it isn't a duly established government. If the entire chronology of this is taken up, the revolution against Somoza brought together diverse groups and quite a, uh, and many just individuals. It is true the Sandinistas were probably the foremost organization, existing organization before the revolution. They had been in, in a communist organization for many years. When the at a certain point of the revolution, when it had been going on for quite some time, they, uh, the revolutionary leadership asked the Organization of American States 
to intervene and see if they couldn't persuade Somoza to step down in order to stop the killing. The Organization of American States asked, what are your revolutionary goals? Well, they were the goals we'd all support. They were the goals of a pluralistic society, of free press, free speech, freedom of religion, labor unions, all of these things. And this was delivered to the organization. The organization then asked Somoza, and Somoza said, if it'll stop the killing, yes, and step down. Right. Then the Sandinistas, taking advantage of their having an organization, they went to work and started eliminating the other revolutionary leaders, their former partners. Right. Some were uh, just disappeared, and uh, some exiled, and a number of them are now a part of what are the Contras. And then, yes, they staged an election. But if you look back at that election, how uh, any other candidates were denied access to uh, the news media, radio or anything of that kind, there is no question that it was, it was a frame-up and it ended up with a total, as we know now, it is a communist government. They themselves at their inauguration announced that their revolution knew no borders. And of course, we saw Cuba step in. We have seen the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union has uh, supported them and given them billions of dollars in aid and support. And we feel that in view of this present peace program that has been advanced, there are such loopholes in it that the pressure that is needed to bring them to the democratization that the, their neighbors are now demanding uh, is provided by the Contras. The $270 million that Secretary Schultz talked about yesterday, that comes right in the middle of these peace proceedings. Will it interrupt them, interfere with them? No, because it is, it's destined for the same thing simply to keep, we want to cease fire. We want the uh, Nicaragua to rec or the Sandinista government to recognize they've got to also sit down at a table with their own people who are represented in the, in the countries. And this they've refused to do. We have asked for that for a long time. The idea of a, of a negotiated settlement is not just new. We've wanted that, but we've known also the only chance you have to get it is to have that threat, that pressure of the people uh, taking over. Looking down the road a few months, what do you foresee in this Nicaraguan situation? Will the pressure work? Well, if it doesn't work, we've got to be in a position that, that we have not, in, in other words, destroyed the opposition. And then the Sandinistas do what there's every evidence they might do. And that is the Sandinistas uh, take advantage of those loopholes make a pretense of democracy, but look at the restrictions they themselves have put. Uh, the appointing of a commission to sort of uh, oversee uh, the democratic processes. Uh, yes, they have Cardinal uh, Obama <coughs> there as, uh, but all of this is gonna be taking place in October. And uh, according to the schedule, uh, the Cardinal is going to be in the Vatican. And the Sandinista government has named his alternate to replace him while he's gone, the vice president of their own government. Mm -hmm. Let me jump, because this coming week will be the Constitution Week. I know that you are generally in favor of repealing the constitutional amendment that limits a president to two terms. Are there other changes you would like to see in the Constitution? Yeah, a balanced budget amendment. <laughs> I know you. I was going to ask you why you keep resisting in that. Well, because 80% of the people, according to the polls, want it. Every place in the United States, standing in front of as many as 40,000 people at an outdoor rally. When I have mentioned that, I am interrupted by applause and many mm. times a standing ovation. In the no, no more states have petitioned for a constitutional convention on the idea. Yeah, but 32 of them have already. Well, some of those were a long time ago, too, were they not? And the thing is, I think there are many of us who, who would rather go the congressional way, because once you open that door uh, to a constitutional convention, uh, no one knows where it'll stop. Well, it's open then to everything that you want to propose. But, but any amendments that came out of such a convention would have to go back to the states for ratification, would they not? 
Uh, yes, but they would have to under that, but they uh, also the same thing, they have that opportunity with the Congress passing this, and it would be so much quicker and more efficient, and we, uh, they de designated that one subject. All right, I won't argue with you on it. I will argue with you, but not right now. Balanced budget amendment and the two-term limitation, what other constitutional changes have occurred to you? Oh, I don't know that uh, uh, there are some, well, there are some things that I have. In the pr uh, presidential election process, for example, would you see any changes there in the um, No, but the I, have, I have some or? social things that I am very definitely on the side that God should not have been expelled from the classroom. Well, and uh, Would you like a prayer amendment then in the Constitution? Uh, I think that what's being done is a violation of uh, of the separation of church and state. Uh, everyone cites that Congress uh, should make uh, no provisions about a, having a, a state religion, but it also says that it should not interfere with the practice of religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it is very easy. Uh, for many years there was prayer in classrooms and it wasn't uh, uh, denominational or anything. It was it was in keeping with what's on, engraved in the stone above the uh, Supreme Court building and other places that in God we trust and we are a nation under God. Then there is the matter of uh, this I would look at further and has to do with the abortion amendment. Mm -hmm. These are the very things that even Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1932 when I cast my first vote which was for him his campaign was to return to the states and local communities authorities and autonomy that had been unjustly seized by the federal government. Uh, we're a sovereign, we're a, we're a federation of sovereign states. And I think there's been a continuous, over recent years, there's been a continuous drive to centralize more and more and take from the states authorities that were vested in them by the Constitution. So I would like mm -hmm. to look at more of those but definitely, I think, I think the uh, amendment with regard to abortion, that was just as murder is. That was in the hands of the state, yes. the state jurisdiction. Now, under the Constitution, only a native-born American can run for president. Would you like to see that provision taken out? No, I don't think so. I think traditionally that... Uh, uh, that the immigrants who come in ought not to have a chance to become president. Well... <laughs> Um, I don't know, maybe that could be more closely looked at, let's say, with um, uh, maybe with an age provision. Uh, uh, if you really look at it, I would have to give some second thought to what happens to someone who came here as a very small child and, mm -hmm. uh, and then all their lives from then on were in this country. I think the provision, we know what some of those were based on back in our beginnings. But I think the provision recognized that we're probably the only country in the world that is open to everyone from every corner of the world. In an interview with um, Carl Rowan, Justice Thurgood Marshall had some very unkind things to say about you, but, mm -hmm. uh, about your record in, in racial justice. Why do you suppose uh, Justice Marshall expressed those views? I don't know, but I'll tell you, I'm surprised that a Supreme Court justice who is supposed to look at all sides of an issue before he makes a decision has obviously made no effort to look at me with regard uh, to racism or discrimination. Jack, I was raised in a household in which the greatest evil was prejudice and discrimination. It was back in a time when there was a great deal of religious prejudice in this country. My father was a rough, tough Irishman and a Catholic. My mother was a Protestant. I'm afraid my father gave up going to church for Lent. So if my brother and I were to get any religion, it was by way of our mother. But uh, this whole thing about prejudice, I was raised that way. I have a record, uh, not only all my life as a sports announcer. I was one of the little handful of broadcasting Major League Baseball over the years who editorialized that baseball should be opened uh, to the other race. And um, then as a governor of California, I discovered that the civil service regulations in California definitely discriminated against the minorities. 
the, uh, there was only a small percentage of them in government employment, and they were only at the lower levels of almost menial labor. But as president, haven't you taken certain actions or positions that have militated against um, the blacks, such as the, your, your desire to get rid of the Small Business Administration, uh, which has helped a good many black entrepreneurs? The yeah. Civil, um, Civil Rights Commission has withered away under your administration. Would these be some of the things that Justice Marshall had in mind? Well, I don't think the Civil Rights Commission has withered away. I think there's been a great change. We've got to recognize what's been done. Small Business Administration wasn't based on that because then I would refer you to our programs with regard to government contracts, defense contracts and all, and how we have energetically, without the small business, gone out to make sure that they were involved in government. And uh, I would also point to the figures on the number of cases. I think we top any other administration that's ever preceded us with regard to the cases that we have initiated for restoration of rights, um, financial problems, salary problems, and so forth, where there has been discrimination. And Jack, I, as I say, and, and in California, I changed all those regulations. And before we left office, we had a, a, a multiplied by several times the percentage of minorities employed, but also employed all the way up. Uh, through government and taking those restrictions away. It's but, been observed that you've appointed, nominated very few blacks or minorities to the federal bench. I am, uh, you know, the truth of the matter was, uh, uh, the, I had to say there weren't too many of them left <laughs> when I got here to a point. And uh, also, uh, I think you, I think your appointments are re reflect uh, uh, political uh, or ideology, I yes. should say. And uh, well, that's behind your nomination of Judge Bork, is it not? Do you uh, uh, you like his political ideology? No, I like the fact that incidentally, I've taken politics, and I did in California, out of uh, the appointment of judges, but. Uh, I think a philosophy, I guess, is what I'm talking about, not politics, a philosophy of that a judge and the Supreme Court should uh, interpret the law. I know that's a cliche now and not make it. I have been very critical of the court in recent years, which I have thought uh, had taken over making the, the laws. Was it fair to say that you hope that with Judge Bork on the Supreme Court, some of these decisions would be reversed, significantly modified? I haven't even given a thought as to whether that's up to the court. I would never suggest something of that kind to them. But would you hope that Miranda would be modified, for example, or the I, exclusionary rule would be Yes, uh, I would. Modified. I come from the state that gave birth to the famous diaper case. Do you know what that was? Diaper case? Yes. I thought I knew every significant Supreme Court well, case, but you've got me on that one. Well, in California, uh, two uh, drug enforcement officers with oh yeah that was a fourth amendment case they had a well they they had a warrant yeah. they searched the house evidence had been given them to believe there was heroin there in that home that the couple were and they found none and they were on their way out when suddenly the one of them turned back to the crib and there was the baby mm -hmm. and he removed the diaper and there was the heroin mm -hmm. yeah. and it was thrown out of court on the basis that the baby had not given its permission to be searched <laughs> unlawful search and seizure yes all right, Marlon has the fidgets over there, so I think my time is just about up. The last time we talked, two or three years ago, you were pumping a little iron. Are you yeah. still doing I'm temporarily uh, uh, removed from that right now since my days at the ranch. I kind of strained a tendon in one arm oh. with our uh, chainsawing and uh, handling of huge logs and so forth. and. Uh, I went into the gym when we came back to try and found out that there was a little, twinge, little definitely. Twinge. So I, I'm going to have to wait a while. I was just teasing Howard about putting on a few pounds. How's your weight doing? Uh, it's holding about even. The thing is, though, that I found from pushing the iron, all of a sudden, the scale was going up instead of going down. And then I found out something. You have to start going by measurements instead of weight. 
because muscle weighs four times as much as flab. And I reached a point where pretty soon the increase in muscle, I added two inches around my chest. Yeah. And, How would you uh, much you add around your waist? Huh? That's that went down. <laughs> <laughs> Very fortunate. Mr. Yeah. President, that's all. I know we're, well, but let me just take one little thing. I've got to tell you an incident that, uh, that makes me so frustrated with things like what Thurgood Marshall said and this whole idea uh, involving me. I played college football beside, I was right guard. I played beside a center who was black. We became the closest of friends, and I had the great pleasure. He ended up at Morris University as an athletic director. And when I came here as president, I had him and his wife to the White House for dinner. And thank God, because a few months later, he died of a heart attack. But in college, one trip, we overnighted in my hometown on our way to the game the next day. And I took the coach into the manager of the hotel in that little town of Dixon, Illinois, to introduce them. And the Hotel manager said uh, to the coach, I can take everybody except your two cutter boys. And our coach said, well, then we'll go someplace. And he said, well, it won't do you any good. There isn't any other hotel in town. We'll take them either. This is in northern Illinois. What year was this? This is back in 1932. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, in 1931, as a matter of fact, I graduated in 32. And uh, as we started out the lobby, the coach just madder than hell. And he said, we'll sleep in the bus. And I said, Mac, you can't do that. They'll know why. And he said, well, what are we going to do then? And I said, well, he had very definitely told me that I could not go and sleep in my own home. I would stay with the team. Well, that was all right with me. I could see the reason for that. But now I said to him, Mac, why don't we go out and you tell him that there isn't enough room for everybody here and we're going to have to break up? And then why'd you put me and uh, Berkey and, and Joe in a cab, and we'll go home. And this man, who could be as mad as he was, turned to me and looked at me and says, you really want to do that? And I, knowing my family, said, yes, I really want to do that. We arrived at the house. I pushed the button on the bell, and Nellie, my mother, came to the door, and I said, Nellie, there isn't enough room in the hotel for all of us. Can you put us up? Not even a quiver. She said, come in, and so forth. And, uh, I never knew that I hadn't gotten away with it until I came here and a press man that had interviewed Berkey in his capacity down there told me that Berkey told him that he and the other one figured mm -hmm. that this was why we were sleeping in our home. His name was Burke? Burkhart. Burkhart. And we nicknamed him Berkey. Mm -hmm. And before we got out of, before out of school, we, eliminated, or we uh, elected him captain of the football team. Good story. Always so good to see you. Well, good to see you. Looking good. Yeah. I better get rid of this microphone. Car. Well, oops. And again, thank you very much for. I think Nancy may see your pain on some weekends. <laughs> <laughs> well, we keep fighting. I think Nancy may enjoy the book. Oh so. yes. And yes. thank you. And just um, Maurice, um, life is a book. Starting with her grandmother and um, what she learned from her father and so on. Uh, I don't get on with that. That's that's always. Thank you. <laughs>